Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the Purpose Mindset webcast. I'm Prathima Stanton. I'm the membership director at Global Washington. For those of you who don't know, Global Washington is a membership association serving Washington-based organizations working on international development. We promote, connect, and strengthen our members who work on a variety of issues from global health, education, environment, and economic development. After our bad shots, uh, the president of our board, and we are thrilled to be part of this event today discussing his book. As you come in, please type your name and organization in the chat. Please use the chat to share relevant links, articles, and comments throughout the event. At the bottom of your screen, there should be a section for Q&A. Please type in your question for the Q&A portion of the event around 5.40 or so. We advise for you to wait to type your question in case your question might be answered throughout the conversation. Uh, please type any logistical questions you have on chat and I can answer your questions. With that, I will um, uh, transfer to Milan, who will start off the event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pratima, and welcome to everyone uh, to this virtual conversation with Akhtar Bacha on his new book, Purpose Mindset. It is a fascinating account of how Microsoft has inspired its employees and its alumni long after they leave the company to change the world. And I don't say that uh, with great hyperbole, it is absolutely true. I'm Alain Verveer and I'm so delighted to be co-hosting this discussion with Pamela Passman. Microsoft established a culture of giving that has encouraged and rewarded employees to turn their passion for the causes they care about that are so important to them into far broader impact, social impact. It is a remarkable story with lessons for all of us, for companies and employees, for individuals and organizations on how we can all enrich our lives and our contributions to society through purpose. I can't think of a more important discussion for these times as we are struggling with strife in our communities and indeed across our country, struggling with COVID and climate change and what it will represent and, in, in, and economic inequality and so much more. Adopting a purpose mindset can truly help us to bring about transformative change something I think we all agree we desperately need. I first met Akhtar about 15 years ago. I had heard about his pioneering work at Microsoft uh, in the work that he was doing on corporate philanthropy uh, and employee engagement. It was work indeed that was far ahead of where everybody else was on these issues uh, from where so many are today. And I was eager to meet with him when I was in Seattle. I asked if I could and gracious as always, Akhtar agreed. And I have learned so much from him since uh, on so many uh, different uh, areas that are relevant to this conversation. Akhtar led Microsoft's community affairs from 2004 to 2014. He is an entrepreneur an educator, a philanthropist, a strategic thinker, an advisor. And today he is at the University of Washington's Evans School of Public Policy. And as you heard, chairman of Global Washington. From 1996 to 2011, Pamela Passman was Microsoft's corporate vice president and deputy general counsel. She worked both in Tokyo and in Redmond, Washington, the headquarters of Microsoft. She played a key role in their giving program. I first met Pamela back then when I met Akhtar uh, in Redmond, Washington. And I'm happy to say that today I'm her neighbor and we have all come together for this conversation. So Pamela, I turn it to you to take, take it away and get us started on the Microsoft story. Great. Thank you much, uh, so much, Milan, for, for co-hosting this with me and, and bringing your very 
broad perspective about how companies, governments, the not-for-profit community works together and, and what we need to do you know, in the future. Um, you know, as you said, this is a great time for Octar's book. Uh, as we all look for more ways to connect with our colleagues and other people and institutions that we hold dear. We're gonna start off with Octar providing some background on, on Microsoft's employee giving program. And then we're gonna come back to some of these broader issues about how we can think about purpose uh, in our lives and, and in our communities. Um, you know, what's interesting about the employee giving program, it, it started you know, very early in Microsoft's life, long before I joined the company or Octar joined the company. Um, and, and today many companies have these employee incentive programs and ways to engage their employees. Uh, but back in the early 80s and certainly through the 90s and, and so forth, uh, it was unique. And, I, and as, as Akhtar will share with us today, really the, the scale and the reach of the program uh, continues to be unlike any others. Um, so Akhtar, why don't, you, why don't you start off with just giving us a, a sense of what this program is, how it's influenced the culture of Microsoft and been influenced by the culture of Microsoft. And, you know, what, what is the secret sauce behind this program that has led to the very significant impact around the world? Milan and Pamela, thank you so much for your kind words. I mean, I'm with two sheroes who have made amazing impact around the world in Milan with her work on empowering women as a global leader. I couldn't ask for a better group of people to chat with me today. Um, you know, I think my story and Microsoft starts in 1993 when my wife, Alka, joined Microsoft on the East Coast. And being in New York, you kind of heard this rumbling in October about something happening on campus. <laughs> and being on the nonprofit side, I kind of was enthused to learn a little bit more about what are these people doing? And why are people so taken in to give and contribute and participate in their community? When we arrived in Seattle in 1998, when Alka moved to Redmond, I saw firsthand this energy and this passion driven by purpose from employees who are willing to participate in any cause. And firsthand, I experienced it after the, 20, the 2000 earthquake in India and how employees from all walks of life came out to donate and the community. But this story starts much earlier. In 1983, Mary Gates, Bill's mother, cajoled her son to start a employee payroll deduction program to support United Way. There wasn't even a match. It was just a payroll deduction where employees could automatically get $20, $30, $50, $100 per paycheck donated to United Way. And that to me was a moment that was seminal in how something gets created. But this moment could have just withered away because Bill really didn't have the time to focus on it, nor should he have, given the responsibilities that he had. But in 1985, in walks in Bill Newcomb as the general counsel to the company. Having worked with Bill Gates Sr., Bill's father in his law firm, but before that, having engaged in Seattle, particularly focused on serving the United Way, the Urban League, other programs. And he comes in and asks Bill Gates and John Shirley, the president at that time, that in addition to running, the legal affairs, he would like to set up four different groups, corporate affairs, industry affairs, community affairs, and government affairs. Now, I can understand government affairs, industry affairs, corporate affairs, because the business is growing. 
and the company need to coalesce around these organizations that were popping up in the software industry. But I just couldn't understand why community affairs. And he basically said that here are these young 20 something working 18 hours a day, living on campus on pizza and coke, trying to change the world through technology and they will establish roots in this community. They will grow up here, they will get married here, they will have kids here. And it, we have to provide them with an opportunity to engage in the community. And that's what happened. That simple act, which Bill agreed to as a visionary that he was and made, made it clear to them that he wanted the donations to go to any nonprofit or organization of the employee's choice and not just to select organizations. And that I think shifted the frame of turning a moment into a movement. And then subsequent leaders that came into the company kept making sure that this program continued to grow and continued to establish roots. 1983, $17,000, 2020, $220 million. And when you, when you look at it, match. right. And, and over that period of time, uh, I think $2 billion worth of employee giving and, and corporate matching, which is really quite, quite stunning. And, and I, I basically think that there were, there were these lots of different changes that happened under Bill Newcomb and the growth. But I think the acceleration happened because of four decisions, uh, three decisions that Pamela made before I came in. One, she shifted the program from philanthropy because then the budget was limited and it could not grow because you used up the budget and it was kind of done to HR where it became an employee benefit. And now it opened up a whole new set of resources that the employees could take. That was huge. Then there was this shift from a $10,000 to $12,000 match and then increased to 15,000. And then this notion of all of these employees, everywhere you went into Seattle, you saw Microsoft employees with nonprofit organizations at every event. But we as a group never knew what people were doing. So to entice them to fill out a form and tell us what they were doing, we decided to match their time to volunteer. And that's those three decisions shifted the scale of the program that allowed it to grow. Because what it did was that it, you now started meeting people where they were rather than getting them to come to you. And I think those three big changes and the fourth one was that by the time we came in, it had become extremely competitive. Every group was fighting to get the most amount of money. And some employees, the new employees were getting all flustered. They weren't sure what was going on. And so we had to tamp it down just a little bit to make it more fun rather than competition, given that Microsoft was such a competitive company. Why don't you talk, Akhtar, a little bit about the month of October and why that was so key? Um, and you know, it was it really was an opportunity for your most recent college recruit and your most senior vice president to work together and to be creative and innovative and also very competitive with their colleagues and other divisions of the company to be sure that at least in the month of October, their organization raised the most money. I think, you know, United Way runs this employee, corporate employee campaign for the month of October. So we basically took that on as a way by which you could bring people to come together. And it became a way where every employee could solicit another employee for donations for the organization of their choice. 
But to make it work, a whole program was created where we had six to eight employees that were seconded to us, loaned to us, to the program that worked from August to November, running this program. Every vice president of the company had to appoint a vice president lead that would excite that group to participate. And they in turn created another group of people that would help them. Recent numbers, eight employees full-time getting loaned, 300 vice president appointed leads and 5,000 other employees that are actually supporting this, which creates anything you want a dog calendar, a cat calendar, cookbooks. The cookbooks that was actually created won a prestigious award in France. Photography books, races, 5K walk, 5K race. People would, you know, Bill would host something at his house or, and there would be an auction. People would get dunked, you know, groups would challenge each other early on both Steve and others had to swim through on and you know got dumped into this little lake in a pond, which is not even a lake, but it was called Bill Lake Bill. And they lost a bet, so they had to jump into that. And the employees had gone and got a lot of ice and put it into the pond so that it became very cold. So both Steve Barmer and Brad Chase had to jump into it. And so, so there were all of these competitions. And what it did is that it became part of the DNA of the company. It became a culture that this is what we did. And what is fascinating is this year, not doing anything in person, they had all of these events virtually. And it became far more inclusive because people from around the country, 80,000 employees now in the United States could participate rather than just the Redmond folks. So you, it became more inclusive, more participatory, and more activities happened where so many people who didn't want to get out of the office could actually now engage. So, so there's very interesting shifts. We, we also saw lots of spillover effects. This, this program had a, a notoriety to it. it. It helped us in recruiting, uh, you know, great talent uh, from across the country. Uh, it really often, you know, was a, a factor when people thought about, well, am I ready to leave the company? Well, then I don't, you know, I give up the match. And, you know, that's an important part of uh, how I feel about my, my compensation and how I think about, I think about the company. Um, but it, it, it had a most profound impact on, on individual employees and their families and the impact that they could have in the local Seattle community, the local Puget, Puget Sound community, but really around the world. And, and that is what is so special about your book, Akhtar, is, is you have many of these stories about individual employees who take on a, whether it's a local cause or a, a, a cause around the world. Why don't you give us a few vignettes of, of employees and, and what they did really spurred by this program? I mean, so I'll give you two. And one, because maybe I'll give two, three quick ones. So one, which is my favorite in some ways, is Kevin Wang, who is a young engineer, Chinese American descent, comes into the company, is very interested in getting other employees to help teach computer science in schools. But he's a very fascinating background because this is what he was doing even in high school, mentoring kids and going out and teaching. His first job out of college was to actually teach computer science in a high school in the Bay Area. And then went to Harvard, got a degree in education and then to pay off his loan, went and came to work at Microsoft so he could actually earn a salary, which was more than what a teacher's salary would be. But continued to wanted to do that, started doing this in two or three schools as a volunteer, came to us. Uh, I, I 
honest, I said, you know, I have no idea what you're doing, Kevin, go away. <laughs> I, but Kevin would not go away. Kevin would, would keep coming back. And eventually this program now has over 6,000 technology company employees that are volunteering to teach computer science classes in underserved schools, both introductory and computer and AP. And these are inner city schools. And these are employees from Microsoft, Amazon, Twi Twitter, Facebook, Google, defense companies in the DC area, and you name it. And he's just grown this. And this happened because he would refuse to let, he refused to take no for an answer and just kept doing it and doing it. And eventually he became part of the team where we brought him on and helped him scale. So that's just one story of an employee who that can just make it happen and the company allowed it to happen. And that's a huge difference. Well, I think more than allowed it, once, once we actually understood what he was doing and that most of the high schools in the, in the Seattle area didn't have AP computer science because they didn't have the teachers to instruct. Uh, you know, we, we, we really did rally around. And again, you know, it was his initiative, but he, he used the giving campaign to get other employees to support and then to know about the program and to actually participate and be instructors. You know, Linda Lockhart and Margot Day are on the call and, you know, they run this organization called Global Give Back Circle, which Margot is part of, but Margot was a VP in the company running the education sector, goes to Kenya to celebrate a 50th birthday, looks at the situation of girls and female genital mutilation and decides that this is what she's gonna focus her life on and comes back and gets connected to Linda Lockhart through Pamela and me and they have now transformed together by getting mentors from all over the world, working with girls to ensure that they get education and you figure out a way to remove and stop this curse on earth that we have and empower women. And so many of them have gone into colleges, have gone and come into the US and studied here and now becoming leaders and change makers. So just to, you know, but here's somebody who was much senior and did it in a somewhat different way. Yeah, and then and there is Marco was, was critical in recruiting hundreds of women across the co company to also be uh, mentors for the Global Give Back Circle. So yeah, really- and there are about 300, and Pamela was one of the mentors. Right? I don't know, you still are, I'm assuming. <laughs> and um, I want to just pivot a little bit because employees have a huge passion for, for educational issues, for humanitarian, whenever there was any kind of disaster anywhere in the world, um, we were immediately you know, put into action to be able to respond both through the company's technology, but also our employees. Um, but at its core, a lot of the employees were, were very interested in technology and advancing STEM, as you talked about, um, coding, other programs to bring uh, technology skills uh, to, to uh, communities that didn't have access. Um, why don't you give us you know, a flavor for, for this passion, this translation of their, their work into their philanthropic passion? So, so one of the things that, I mean, you know, as I started off by saying, you know, employees have always volunteered in nonprofit organizations. When Satya Nadella became the head of Microsoft, he introduced a week of hackathons. It's actually the largest private sector hackathon in the world, where thousands of employees are out there hacking. And within that, we, the community affairs team, the philanthropies team created a program called Hack for Good, where hundreds of our employees work with nonprofit organizations to help them with technology solutions. And just some amazing things have come out of it. But one of the stories that I talk about is of Roberto and Francesca, a young couple in Italy, after two miscarriages, they had a son. 
and the son had a stroke in birth and is paralyzed on one side. And here are these two young people just looking at this child and saying, what are we going to do? And their focus for the first two years is on improving the weak side. And they participated in the hackathon along with 25 other families, I mean, 25 other employees from around the world to create a program that can recognize epilepsy. Because one of the things with kids with stroke is they have an epileptic attack. It's hard to recognize parents get into, you know, a whole, it's just very hard. So they created an app that can actually do that. But in that process, they actually started talking to neuroscientists and other experts and learned about this whole concept called mirror imaging and how your brain mirrors the stronger part of your body if you focus on it. And that's what they started doing with Marco. And they started seeing significant change. And they've organized a whole uh, effort now called Fight the Stroke. They've given multiple TED Talks. They've got a community of people who kids have had stroke and are creating multiple technologies through the hackathon to help these kids. So there is just this amazing, you know, there have been robotic arms that have been created by employees and other solutions, including just setting up, you know, nonprofits website. So you can go from the mundane to some of the most exciting solutions. And I think that's what bringing people together in a common space helps you do. You know, it's been so interesting to hear about how the company's programs indeed have spawned all of these change makers that you've been talking about, Akhtar. Uh, and there are far more to read about in the book. It's utterly fascinating and inspiring, I might, I might add. I, I just wanna remind uh, those who are listening that they uh, can put their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I'll continue with a few more, but then we really do want to turn to all of you uh, who are listening in. Uh, I want to move this a little bit, Akhtar, if I might, from Microsoft itself uh, and to uh, what it has launched over all of these years uh, to the whole notion of purpose. Why is purpose so important in our lives, in our everyday lives? Uh, after all, we've got Professor of, professors of happiness today talking about the centrality of purpose to happiness. And maybe you can tell us, uh, how do we develop this purpose mindset? After all, it is the topic of the book. Uh, we've learned a lot about Microsoft, but now how do we develop a purpose mindset? So to be honest, actually, I wanted to find another word for passion. I just hated people coming into my office and saying, I'm passionate to make change and you hire me. And I just could not understand. I said, if you're passionate to make change, why don't you just go and make change? Why do you need me? So I kind of started looking deeper into it. And I said that, why, why this? I, and that's when I started discovering purpose. That if we are driven by growth and the growth mindset. The seminal work of Carol Dweck from Stanford and absolutely the most important thing, right? That how do we go from a fixed mindset into a growth mindset? But the growth mindset to a large extent is still about the self and about the workplace, right? The company, which is why companies all adopt the growth mindset because it makes people you know, become much more in innovative, et cetera. But then how do you take that and apply it for the common good? How do we go from the me, which is what passion is, I am passionate to make change, to the we, that I have a purpose to see the world in a different way. So it's not about who you want to be, 
but it's more about who you want to serve. And if we can figure out a way to shift that mindset, so purpose to me became that driver that said that if you can get people to activate their purpose, then you can actually do two things. One, you're making, you're taking that personal satisfaction and having a much broader impact. But two, purpose also becomes that renewable source of energy for you itself. Because we all get depleted. And if companies can become a place for healing, purpose then becomes that way by which you can do that. And in Microsoft's case, it just happened to be the employee engagement program that became the catalyst to ignite purpose in employees. And that's why to me, purpose is very important because it allows us to think beyond ourselves but to actually put the community in first. And, and don't we also have to recognize that each of us has the capacity uh, to unleash this purpose, that we, no matter where we are, no matter what we find ourselves doing, uh, that we have the power, if you will, to find our purpose, and then to make this kind of change. Let me just tease this out a little bit and bring us to some of the troubles that we are all contending with uh, domestically and globally that I mentioned earlier. In your last chapter, you touch on COVID. Maybe you could help apply this a little bit to circumstances uh, that are so immediate to many of us. So I was writing my last chapter when I was told that you could not move. <laughs> and so it's I, a current book. Yeah, I mean, this was, you know, I mean, I had a meeting with Bill Gates for March 25th, and we were all, we all went into lockdown. So I had my Zoom meeting. In this case, it was a Teams meeting with Bill and with Satya for my last two interviews. But as we were kind of looking at this, where we were all asked to completely shift the way we behave and the way we work and where we interact, you saw two things happening. One, people coming together in just this fascinating way to help. Whether people needed food, people were making food, people needed masks in hospitals and people were just, communities were coming out and sewing masks. Millions of masks got sold. Meals were getting delivered because kids were now out of school and were gonna get hungry. People were going out and saying, I'm just gonna go order food because I don't want this restaurant to shut down. So you saw this coming together that we had never seen before. And it was as if, and you know, you didn't have at that point the rolling disaster that we are seeing now in terms of death. You were actually just seeing closure. So what I felt was that here is this environment in which on one side you are actually coming together and on the other side, there were people who are actually trying to pull us apart. And this concept of bridging, we all like to bond. We bond because we birds of a feather flock together. We kind of have our own little communities. But bridging is when you actually don't know the other person, you don't have their, you, you disagree with them, yet you go and do something together. And COVID allowed you to do that. But companies, when they create programs, where they create a place, where they create a square, where employees can build that muscle of coming together around a common cause, then you actually extend it out into the community. And I think the only reason we are all alive is because many of us are actually coming together and are bridging because this virus 
will stop at nothing unless we are all collectively doing, working for the good. So I think that to me became that interesting facet of the book, which I would have never got to had it not been for the fact that I got stuck in this little corner of my apartment and I had to say and started noticing what was happening outside in the community around the world. And I think that's the important lesson. And I think that that's what needs to be carried forward. Well, and it strikes me too, given how we have come to depend on technology uh, at this moment in very significant ways, how those investments that were made by so many of the employees uh, really have helped people, especially young people in terms of their remote learning and so much more uh, to have this lifeline. So all of this comes together uh, in many ways. I wanna ask you one more question, Akhtar, before we move to our um, audience. Um, and that's about uh, companies and where they find themselves today. Uh, there's been a whole history of philanthropy, corporate social responsibility. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing companies see the social impact that they can have as part of their business, integral to their business, not something separate. Um, you mentioned at the outset some of the work that we've done on public-private partnerships. That's become a big part of this world on how governments can bring their competencies with those that they don't have, that the corporate sector has, for example, or NGOs have, uh, and work together in collaboratives that might not take place otherwise. Uh, and bringing resources to bear. And I was thinking about uh, the Business Roundtable, which last year, I think stunning many people, frankly, uh, and the Business Roundtable is those 200 biggest companies. So the CEOs of those companies uh, signed a statement uh, of purpose, if you will, uh, that went beyond the, what the companies owe to their shareholders to their stakeholders their employees, the communities, uh, the suppliers. So can you just say a little bit about how companies benefit from all of this and why they are coming uh, to a place I think that maybe we couldn't have predicted um, not that many years ago? So, I mean, interestingly, this movement of conscious capitalism has been growing for a number of years, right? I mean, in 2008, Bill Gates at WEF talked about conscious capitalism in his speech there. That has got picked up in 2011 with Mark Kramer and Bill uh, Porter, Michael Porter at Harvard in the shared value movement. Right. Conscious Capitalism, the book came out written by John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods along with Raj Sisodia. So you've seen, and you know, Carol Cohn has been, you know, has been doing this work on purpose and purpose in business and purpose and profits, you know, Harlan Meyer at Oxford University. So there is, there is a lot that has been written and there has been this slow movement around the recognition that businesses are made up of people. Companies only exist because they have people in these companies. Otherwise it's just an edifice. And these individuals, our world is shifting. We are shifting. We are bringing together new sensibilities because of what is happening around us. And that push is percolating up. There is of course then the pressure that is coming from the top where the UN with this millennial development goals and now the you know, 17 sustain, sustainable development goals are holding everybody's feet to the fire in terms of what are we collectively doing so you're seeing all of these movements come about. Now, why is this important? First, 
you have to ensure, I mean, as Satya Nadella said, that if you're just going to be a rent seeker, you're not going to survive. But if you're going to leave something back of value that goes beyond your product, then your company is going to grow. And purpose is that one piece that allows you to distinguish yourself between one company and another. You know, one of the things I wanted to tell Pamela is when she said, you know, the millennial generation are looking at a whole different way to engage in a company. My son, this is a long time ago now, you know, graduated from the University of Michigan and he went for one of these fairs, you know, recruitment fairs and he went to the Microsoft presentation and he said the, the, the lady that was there never talked about Microsoft. She only talked about the employee giving campaign. She just showed us a video. And he called me up and said, did you do that video? I said, I have no idea who did this video. It never came out of us. But the distinction is you can go to Google, you can go to Facebook, you can go to Amazon, you can go to Microsoft, you can go to any of these companies, you're gonna get more or less the same pay. Why come to one company? What is the distinguishing factor? And today people want to feel that their work is changing people's lives for the better. And I think that's the business relationship. Now, the second relationship is you can have a slogan, and I still worry that most companies are within the slogan phase yet of the 200 that have signed. And if you take the surveys, 87% you know, want, have created purpose as part of their statement, but only 25% have activated it. So the question is, how do you activate it? And I think my suggestion is activating purpose in your employees is the first step to get there because your employees are the ones that are going to carry the water for you, not the CEO and not the executive leadership team. And if you can figure out different ways, whether it is through an employee giving campaign or through other ways in which you bring employees together and provide them the opportunity to make a difference that goes beyond the company, it comes back to you. It comes back in spades to the company and it comes back in spades to the individual and their families. I mean, Pamela talked about the families. There are so many families that are involved. The kids are involved. The spouses are involved. Grandparents are involved. It has become a community activity. Neighbors get involved because you are working at Microsoft and you're saying, I'm gonna go support that cause. And suddenly that whole neighborhood comes together. So I think that's what you can do. And I think if we all did that just in a little bit, it shifts our dynamics. It just shifts the dynamics of society. Well, that's great advice. And I think it's an extraordinary um, lesson in scaling beyond the ways that we usually talk about scaling. So uh, uh, lots to think about, Akbar. Uh, I think, Pamela, if I can turn to you and uh, tell us what questions we might have coming in from our listeners. Great. Well, we have some fabulous questions already, but if others have questions, they should, they should type them in. Um, uh, and if you would prefer to um, ask it directly, we can un unmute you. So let us know that as well. But why don't I just jump in with some of the questions that we already have. And this really just follows up. Great question. Uh, really bringing it back to the, the challenges that we're facing today. In the wake of dual global crises, COVID and, and racial and social justice, do you believe employees will demand more employee engagement opportunities and that employees will see purpose as a more critical part of their mission? So, you know, this is well established at, at Microsoft, but what are, you, what are you seeing, what are you hearing uh, about other companies and, and companies beyond tech? So, so, I mean, you know, just take the 
सी आर ले लिया और जिस टेक हेल्थ केयर सो आई थिंक वन ऑफ दी हेल्थ केयर सिस्टम अनाउंस दिस मिलियन मास चैलेंज इन मार्च एंड दे बेसिकली सेट हेयर इज अ गाइड हेयर इज हाउ यू कैन क्रिएट अ मास्क we would like to get million masks the website got overloaded men women kids families all started stitching masks i had to stitch a mask with alka and we have masks we start, we made so many masks to give away and to wear so these are this is just just one example of people just a company puts out a challenge and people came together in another company they would feed their employees for lunch because the company was not located close by to restaurants for people to go easily and get lunch so they would feed employees for lunch they all went home all working from home one of the employees spouse was a school teacher she said kids are not getting fed can we use that money to feed kids the employee called the ceo the ceo said yeah fine let's do that but that was a one time thing but what it did it suddenly shifted the dynamics in the company which said an employee can ask and the executive team will listen immediately after that you started seeing black lives matter other employees in that company said what about that then you started getting the election employees started talking about what about the election and now they have actually set up a program that says you know you can take a week off to do whatever you want you can go get out the vote if that's what you want to do you can go educate yourself on black lives matter you can go volunteer and we will support you as a company so just these small examples of how we can ourselves and i go back to kevin bang and i have several stories like that where employees took it on themselves not the executives to start something that has reached scale because if it is successful in a small way a company has the ability to make it scale We have another question that's also quite relevant uh, to what's happening today, uh, and the question is: having a sense of purpose is one of the strongest predictors of mental health and well-being. Lack of purpose is strongly associated with hopelessness, which is one of the strongest predictors of suicide. Have you collected data to demonstrate the mental health benefits of this work at Microsoft or elsewhere? Yeah, that's a great question, and. the simple answer is that i have not collected any data but anecdotally what we know as every single person that i talk to that i interviewed for the book employees or anybody that we were there for 10 years and employees came to us and said just this ability i was just so frustrated with my work and you gave me the opportunity to go out and volunteer it just reenergized me it just took me to the all of us are never going to be happy with our work we all have to do silly things right i mean people said oh you sit and give away money i said no i have to say no i don't give away money i only say no because there are other people who decide where the money should go and because i am the head i am told say no so i have to just go and say no so every day i go home say i said no i said no so i said okay how do i change myself to feel good about it then you figure out how you work to do that so i think all of these things you know and one of our executives bill hill who's now the head of uh the paul allen com- set of companies he said that when i got involved with the community volunteer work at microsoft now whether this is true or not i don't know but this is what he said 
the, the color test that you actually do, his would always come out as orange, which is the highly aggressive A types, right? So Bill and once he started getting involved in this, his color test came out as yellow. And he said that this is me wrong. He said, no. So he said, yeah, I actually grew sense of empathy, which I never had before. But the important thing for him became that what I got to do at Microsoft, I saw it as a privilege. He worked in other Fortune 500 companies, which also had employee giving programs. And he said there it was expected. Here you got invited in. And I think that inviting in is what helps you re-energize yourself, which then becomes that balm to your mental health. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I think it's it's all anecdotal, uh, but it was something that we saw, not just in the month of October, but the interest and excitement that our fellow employees had about the role that they could play in their community. Uh, we certainly saw this in in times of great stress, like disasters, where yeah, um, the employees came together and wanted to have an impact and felt like they were doing something. They were making. Um, an impact uh, when, when there was such great need. Uh, again, if you've got questions, please, uh, please add them to the Q&A function. Um, there's another great question. Again, how can we integrate purpose into the business agenda and the strategic plan of companies? And what is the role of sustainability agenda in this? You know, as we, as we see, companies are much more focused on their uh, environmental impact um, we see you know, many employees quite interested in getting their companies more engaged on climate issues, personally getting uh, engaged on climate issues. How do you see this specific issue uh, being integrated into, into companies and employee activism? So I'll give an example from Amazon. We all like, we, we all buy from Amazon. Amazon is our savior right? I mean, everything you want, it comes, you, it's like your mother, you just shout Amazon and something, toilet paper appears. <laughs> but we also all hate Amazon. And Amazon has never been a big believer in philanthropy, but it has changed. Companies evolved. It has changed over the last six, seven years, where they become much more serious about this. Right, they've just put out this $2 billion investment around homelessness. Bezos has put in a $10 billion around climate change. And he, actually his parents, which Pamela and I both know because we used to partner with Jackie, Bezos and Mike, where they were doing the philanthropy. So the thing is that companies evolve and there is a time for everything to happen in a company. Microsoft has happened very early on. In other companies, it will come a little later. And part of the reason it comes is because there is employees start asking for it. And the sustainability agenda now has become key because even at Microsoft, right? What was our first, you know, Microsoft earlier sent package products. So we used to look at it and say, okay, what is the impact of cardboard boxes and all of that. Once we went to the class, well, now we got to do nothing. We just send them a license, a key. There is no impact. Then you suddenly start looking and said, now we actually have cloud and cloud has a major impact. And therefore then it started creating a whole new look at the environment and environmental sustainability. And how does that impact? And that out of that comes this commitment that will go carbon neutral in by 2030. So, so I think the point I'm trying to make is that companies are moving to it, but if you don't get employee pressure, it takes much longer because at the executive level, on a day-to-day -day basis, you are always driven by revenue and that will never change. So employees play a very important role and we as individuals play an important role. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make in the book 
is that we ourselves can develop our purpose mindset and in doing so bring about these changes. No, I think that's right. And when you, when you look at a company, it's of course made up of employees and, and the senior leaders, but it's also the board of directors, yeah. different contexts that they bring to their, their roles as, as board directors. Uh, and then the local community and the local government, um, all of them impacting, uh, pushing and prodding uh, yeah. an organization to move forward. It, it, isn't it also true that in many ways, what we're talking about from a company's perspective is the win-win factor. This is obviously in the self-interest of a company, whether it has to do with, you know, it's emerging markets or the purchasing power of women, for example, investing in women as a result, or any number of things, the sustainability agenda. But at the same time, it is bringing about societal change. And one of the self-interests is ensuring that employees are going to feel a sense of ownership in the company. Uh, they're going to be happy to work there. They're going to be um, long retained uh, in terms of their employment. So it, it's a shared value, really. It's that the company benefits in significant ways, but society benefits in significant ways. And I think purpose is, as much as I think, you know, growth mindset is a selfish approach. In some ways, purpose is also a selfish approach. I, I mean, there are very few people who are going to be Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama or Kailash Satyarthi who are willing to give their lives for the well-being of society and are going to be truly compassionate. But most of us are in the spectrum of being generous to having empathy. And the closer we get to empathy, the better off the community is. And it is, you know, purpose is a way to rejuvenate yourself, which is selfish. But in doing so, you're also making the community better, which is the same thing for the company. Having purpose rejuvenates the company and in doing so makes the company better, makes the company more profitable, makes the shareholders more profitable, makes the community richer. So it becomes this virtuous cycle. So I, I think there are very few of us who are actually going to be selfless. <laughs> and that's fine. I mean, I think we need selfless person. Martin Luther King, we, you can, you know, there's a whole range of them. But we don't need selfish people. What we need is people that with a purpose that will have empathy for the common good. And if we can move towards that, then we keep making society better. Do we have any more audience questions, Pamela? I think that's all that we have. Thank so you. maybe I could ask one more because you did mention um, this issue in some ways, but you talk about the purpose economy. What do you mean by the purpose economy? Because uh, you devote some space in the book to that as well. So Aaron Hurst, the friend and colleague who lives here, wrote this book called The Purpose Economy. And he believes that we've kind of gone from the agricultural economy to the industrial economy, to the information economy. And now we are in an economy that is driven by purpose. His thesis is that if you take any room, you can divide people up into three. People driven by purpose, people driven by wealth, and people driven by status. And by the way, people driven by wealth and status are not something to be looked down upon. It's just the stage that they are in. And we've seen that even at Microsoft, right? There are people that walk in and the first day they want to do volunteer their time and give. They'll walk into my office and say, what can I do more? What can I do more? And then there are other executives who I've written in the book who came much later on because they felt completely settled in their lives that they could do this. So what he is saying is that if we can actually shift the mindset of people, not make them 
not have the primary driver being purpose, but if the secondary driver is purpose, those that are motivated by wealth and status, now you actually create a very different environment in the company where the driver is purpose and the economy is around purpose. And that shift happens because then you can get people to mentor each other, collaborate with each other, work with each other. So it's not about making everybody having a purpose as the primary driver, but it is about having a purpose mindset. And when I was writing the book and I obviously interviewed him and we were you know, batting around titles, he said, why don't you call it the purpose mindset? That's what you're trying to do is you're actually trying to move from the economy to the mindset. And that the economy only comes if you get people to have that mindset. And I think that's what we are trying to do. Well, that brings us to the end of the stimul stimulating conversation. And I'm gonna hold up my copy of Purpose Mindset mm -hmm. and hope that everybody who doesn't already have a copy will go out and purchase it. It's a wonderful read. It is truly inspirational, but in many ways, it's a book for our time. Uh, and the changes we have to see. So Akhtar, thank you so much for writing it, but more importantly, thank you for what you have done all of these years to make such a difference. Um, and I wanna thank everybody who joined us, obviously to Pamela for co-hosting um, and good night, ever onward, but onward with purpose. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. But I just wanted to make a pitch for our local bookstore in this time. If you do want to buy, please buy it from Island Books and I will go there and sign it and mail it out to you. So you will get a personalized signed copy, but otherwise you can of course buy it from Amazon or anywhere else if you want right. to buy it. But do support your local bookstore if you can. Yes. So thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. I so greatly appreciate it. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.